Hi, I'm Matt Goodison. Welcome to Play in the System, episode one, a podcast dedicated to creativity, uh, artistry, and the role that creativity plays in the world, hopefully as a force for good. Today, we've got an amazing episode coming up featuring Brian Eno's biographer and musician, David Shepard. David Shepard um, has written an incredible book called On Some Far Away Beach that's all about Brian Eno. um, And what I think is fascinating about David's approach to this book is he wanted to look at the book as a diary of ideas, a diary of creative ideas. David is also a musician. He's put out records on Village Green recordings as David John Shepard. Ellis Island Sound with Pete Astor and also Snow Palms of which I too am a member. So yeah go and have a listen to David's music, check out his book. Today's podcast we're going to be talking about really the larger uh, socio-economic, socio-economic and political role um, and, and how that affects being an artist uh, in the world today. Also, inevitably, there's a coronavirus aspect and we, we talk about and explore this moment of potential great change, um, where we're at and where, as a species, we could be going. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. David Shepard, welcome to episode one of the new Play in the System podcast. The purpose of this, um, we talked at length about its conception, is to look at creativity as a force for change. So, David, you have spent your life in the creative industries doing a multitude of different things. Um probably best known as Brian Eno's biographer, um, even though that's probably not what you've spent most of your time doing. Also very um, well versed in putting out lots of albums under the name Snow Palms and David John Shepherd and Ellis Island Sound. And a few others. There's probably some others, isn't there, in there. Not a man to ever wave a flag over your own creativity. That's how I uh, best know you. Um, We also, I am also a snow palmer. So we have many, many, many conversations. And it felt really important to me to have you as the first guest on this podcast. You'll probably be on several times, quite a lot of times, I hope, because uh, part of this was born out of many of the conversations that we have on a near daily basis, ranging from quite uh, a lot of different topics, usually all at the same time, from creativity to studio practice, to instruments, to music, uh, poetry, books, politics, and all those kind of things. So I have no preset questions. um, But I mean, what a time to start this. I mean, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant time to start it, in a way. Yeah. But, um, you know, all bets are off. And what well, in terms of creativity, I think everybody in the world, practically, is looking for answers to questions which um, previously, the, some, of, some of which they didn't even know were questions before. Uh, what's mm. happened? Like, how can we live? Why should we live? 
in a certain way? Why have we been living in a certain way? So it's, what it's done is, I'm not, I'm not the first person to notice this, but the whole virus thing, it has concentrated a lot of questions which were buzzing around the ether, and it's put them front and center. Mm. So, and it's a lot of questions about how we want to live and uh, how how are we going to change the the systemic issues that are mm-hmm. stopping the world from changing because there's a kind of power structure there which refuses to shift because those who retain the power make sure that it doesn't shift or that it appears to be unshiftable. Now, mm. the wheels have now sort of come off that a little bit because of um, Mother Nature. Um, and so I think it opens up this kind of vista for change. Now, change can be could be really bad, uh, but it could also be really good. And um, it's up to people who have ideas, I think, to put them into the into the theatre of of action. Um, and, you know, and so now it's time to really start thinking about things which might ordinarily just be creative decisions or about, about you know, aesthetics or about a um, process of creating a work of art or a piece of music or whatever, now feel that they can be applied, not in some sort of uh, airy-fairy kind of, you know, theoretical or hypothetical way, but um, can actually be, be applied and have a chance of, of um, having some agency, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's true of creative, but it also it's true of political ideas, you know, ideas which were kind of roundly dismissed as being kind of crank, crank ideas or, oh, that'll never work. You know, suddenly those ideas are being put in place because it's an emergency, uh, oh. you know. So, so that's why it's very interesting. That's a very long answer to your, it wasn't even a question, was it? But I've, uh, I've rambled. But it is, it is a fascinating time to be alive. It is. And what's interesting is, David, you are the journalist uh, of the pair of us. And here I am uh, interviewing the interviewer. What would you say the big questions to emerge out of this time are? Um, well, there are several. I think the, the, the one overriding one is, is uh, it's not even a question, it's a sort of realisation. It's a realisation that how how society works, who, who's important, who's really important. And we, we realise now, if we didn't realise this before, that, the, that what's really important are the people who preserve life and keep things going so that we're allowed to, to sit around in, in nice studios and make music and all the rest of it. Before we can even do that, someone has to deal with the trash. Someone has to stop your cancer. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we, these are things, this is what I meant earlier, really, in a way. We always knew these things were were true, but now they're right in the centre of, our, of our, our life. And what's, you know, the corollary of that, I can never say that word, uh, is, is that, um, I can write it, but I just can't pronounce it. Um, <laughs> the, you know, pe- people like, uh, you know, hedge fund managers and, and bankers, um, uh, and stock stock traders, uh, we now see their relevance, and mm. um, their actual relevance to human life is zero. And and actually, what they do is preserve their own power. And mm. this is a, this is a political point, but I'm not say, I'm not saying it as a as a as a kind of revolutionary call to arms. It's just a clear observation of the facts that you have a self sustaining system, which is a which is um, a kind of clamp on everybody else. Um, because we have to believe, we, the proletariat, if you want to call us that, you know, the, the, the ordinary folks, we have to be made to believe that with the system is the system. And we can't change it. All we can do is rearrange the deck chairs on this particular Titanic to maybe get ourselves a, a better view as we, as we go down. Um, but the captains uh, will always be the captains. And I think what's happened now is the question that arises is how do we, not in a kind of, um, you know, storm the palaces way, but in a way, how do we wrest control back to communities, people, so we can make everybody's life a bit better? And, you know, what's, I thought it was really interesting what happened you know, with the homeless people in, in Britain, 
campus in London, where I am. Uh, you know, overnight, this problem, this big problem for homeless people on the street was solved overnight. Mm. It was mm. solved. It can be solved. Uh, and, of mm. course, what's going to happen now is that the, the homeless people will slowly be put back on the street. How do we stop that happening? So the, the question that I want to answer is how, how, how do we stop, in the wider sense, how do we stop the homeless being put being made homeless again and, and all the other things which have been fixed uh, to a certain extent uh, and, and whether that means things like universal income and all that uh, I'm interested in those ideas I think those are those are the future mm. I think they've always been the future I think Bertrand Russell a hundred years ago uh, was already thinking about these ideas uh, and, and predicting that it would be, be true when he talks about leisure the leisure, uh, the leisure society, etc. Um, so these are the really big ideas, I think, that, that this, is, this is thrown up. Uh, and of course, those who are still in the power, which include obviously the government in this country, and the you know, military industrial machine and the financial centres, are very keen for everyone to get back to work. You know, it doesn't matter if they die, because it's more important to keep the system, keep the system in place, don't endanger mm. the system. <laughs> Um, so that's what we're looking at uh, and the mm. questions are how can we and by we I mean anybody who isn't in that tiny tiny elite uh, in, the, in the citadels of power how do we make the best of this mm. and turn it to the advantage of the majority that's the question so if you'd like to give me the answer to that, <laughs> so my next question how do you feel we go about answering such a difficult question what steps do we take to answer that question and 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 you know well, going back on your previous point i think the system or believers in the system or the you know the staunch capitalists will say that the reason we can afford to put all these social experiments in place is because of the wealth accrued through a capitalist and neoliberal society what would you say to that? Well, I thought all it tells you is that the money is there. The magic money tree is there. The money was always there. The lie they spun is that it wasn't there. Yeah. Um, the money was always there. It's just redistributing it so that everybody gets a chunk. Uh, you know, get it back from the Cayman Islands. You know, <laughs> there are billions. There are billions. Uh, you and I went to a talk by, uh, um, uh, back in the, in the winter. Yanis uh, Faku Ferris Yanis in conversation with Brian Eno. <clears throat> yeah, and Baron Faku said a really interesting thing about the amount of idle money that sits mm. in the city of London. Um, it's in the trillions. It's like uh, it, it's the it, it's like the you know the gross national product of a medium-sized European country is just mm. sitting there. Um, there's tons of money. There's tons of that money. was a great and talk. Also, oh. It was a great talk, but what, mm. what, the thing that I take, took away from that, which I really think is relevant to this, is the idea of quantitative easing. You know, this idea of when, when, the, when the banks fail, we print more money and we give mm. it to the banks. Because, uh, and the excuse for, is that in this way, the banks then allow everything to continue. Mm. You know, people can go and get their money and, and still have their business and, what, and all the rest of it, which is a fair point. But if you can do it that way, you can also cut out the banks and just give it to the people. Mm. Quantitative do you, easing. For the, for do you the, feel that? Do you feel that the the government's response to this crisis is different from the financial crisis of two thousand and eight? Yeah, it had to way, be. Do you think? It had to be. I think because the just because of the um, the, the the threat of death level, <laughs> <just slowly. laughs> so, you know, it's a slower death. You know, by by austerity is a much slower death. You know, it's ten years of. <laughs> Slow murder. Whereas the, if they hadn't acted, this would have been, we'd had half a million people being buried right now. So they had to act. That's the big difference. Um, uh, they had to act and they had to, they had to shelve their ideology. They had to, you know, this was what, this was one stage where you could, you know, you couldn't put it all to the market. Um, you had to act fast. You had to act as mm. government. You had to act in a central way. You had to act, uh, in a way that a command economy works in a way. But uh, I think the, 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 uh, what's interesting about it is that you, know, you see it creeping back now. You see it with the whole Cummings thing and all his, all his mates are, you know, getting the, the juicy contracts and 
Mm. Uh, so all the corruption is still there. But in a way, that is now highlighted because you've seen, you, you've had this, um, this kind of large S, you know, put on behalf mm. of government, munificence on behalf of government uh, to keep, keep people alive, which should be its ultimate and primary duty. Um, and uh, <laughs> now they're starting to slide back, you know. So you sort mm. of see the, you see the, this, the leopard cannot change its spots, you know. It's mm. always, you know um, but it's shown up now. And you have this great sort of um, contrast between the rhetoric of the right and, and, and of you know uh, the, of, of, cap, of cap, supporters of capital as the driver of modern life, and the reality you know of, of, of everybody dying from this thing. But of course, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to die. Mm. Um, and uh, so the idea that you know that there is this idea in in, in capitalism that you know, in free market capitalism that what is it that uh, the rising tide floats all boats? Yeah, um, it's not true. It's clearly <laughs> not true. It's clearly not true uh, because a lot of boats are anchored to the to the bottom of the harbour and they never get up. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's been made very visible now, and you know, mm. even some of the proselytizers of the right on the you know in the right wing press, etc. You can see they're uncomfortable supporting some of these things. So we have seen this sort of you know sea sea change, or sea potential sea change anyway. In 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 that, of course, it's not reflected in party politics. Let's not get let's not go there because it's you know that's a, that's another podcast um, or ten. Yeah, but. Um, <laughs> You know, you see it, but let's let's very quickly go there. I mean, it's this, the whole thing about the demonization of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and I'm not here to, to to you know to raise a flag for Jeremy Corbyn or not, but you can see what happened there is that there was a threat to the system. Uh, it all, you know, when Labour almost won in 2017 against all odds, um, and you got you almost got a government that would wanted to dismantle the system a tiny bit, <laughs> only a tiny bit, really. It wasn't that radical? But of course, that that just couldn't be allowed. So the the, the machinery went into overdrive to demonise this man and to create all this. So that's just another example of um, of how kind of ubiquitous the the clamp of the system is on everything. And that's yeah. why you know why I still think there's a glimmer of hope here. That, you, know, some... you say um, you say the demonisation of Jeremy Corbyn, and you're sort of referring to. A, th- a they, who would you say the they is in that demonization? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, well, you know the the it's you know it's the dark star, the dark side, isn't it? You know, it's the, when I look at, I was looking at some photos this morning. Someone posted some very beautiful pictures of the city of London from the Woolwich uh, Thames barrier, you know, and it it looked like the Death Star. Mm. You know, you see this how irrelevant it looks now. This gleaming citadel of money you know that just mm. looks after itself um it really it, it, it does look that's what my, my image about it's the death star mm. um let's hope you know i think there probably is a little flaw in there that we could go in and with our x fighters or whatever they call it anyway but um <laughs> who's responsible well it's a, it's a tiny tiny minority but very powerful people it's the it's mm. the the british establishment um you know the ones who got all their money from slavery, etc., um, and colonialism, um, exploitation. So the the long the old money, but you've also mm. got the oligarch classes. You know the Russian oligarch. The, you know we live in an oligarchy. We don't live in a democracy. We live in, a, in an oligarchy. That's obvious. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, so it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's a relatively small cabal of uh, extremely rich and powerful uh, people, mm. including media barons um, as well. Um, it's not musicians, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, so sorry about well, that. That's all right. We'll have a bit of a technological freeze. I've got my post. A bit of chocolate. you got your post. Um, so I think that that's really set the foundation for the central narrative of this podcast, which is about creativity being a creative. Mm. Um, There's several different tangents we could kind of talk about now. 
Um, one of them is is the the system and how that affects creativity, and the other is a more personal kind of narrative, um, which is how you know what role does creativity have in this change? What are the roles now of musicians, and have they changed as a result of these um, the surfacing of of what feels like the twenty first century climate change, Black Lives Matter. Um, we've also got, you know, global pandemics and we've got a capitalist kind of system um, probably circling all of it. Um, so, yeah, which of those kind of threads do you fancy picking up on? Do you, you know, do you fancy kind of looking at the way that the system affects being a creative, um, which then in turn affects the system? Or, or how do we, um, as people facilitate creativity how do we approach our creativity against the backdrop of this um 21st century environment well in, in a way i don't think those are i don't think they're different discussions in a way i think they're, yeah they're, it's kind of holistic isn't it this, this whole thing i think um i think what i'm interested in particularly interested in that, that, that is what is the function of a you know a, an artist or musician in, the, in our case um uh, why are we doing it? You know, mm. why are we making? Why are we making it? Um, and feeding that into that sort of, you know, uh, e- economic political picture, rather gloomy one that I painted at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't exactly a vibe up, was it? <laughs> no, I kind of went. I went on a bit of a dark, dark rant there. Uh, um, but it's you know that's just the way it is uh, you know but given that given the, the dark side that i just you know so what you know what do we do you know what mm. um i mean one of the things that you and i share is that we both teach we both mm. teach be, young people involved in music or want to be involved in music um and what i see w- with a lot of those students is um an engagement with music using a whole bunch of different precepts than the ones I engaged with it when I was their age. And also different precepts with the one which I think I still engage with it. Yeah. Um, not exclusively, but there's a tendency, uh, and I'm interested to see what you think about this, but um, tendency for young people who are interested in music to, to uh, and this is not a criticism, but, but to think of themselves as kind of small independent branding units um, that have to fit into a kind of matrix, a commodified matrix uh, of music. And that doesn't mean they all want to be huge superstars. It's just to, to uh, some of them do, but um, just to sort of have agency in a, in a, in a current sort of music industry as they perceive it, it's about a lot of box ticking in terms of, um, what we could broadly call marketing. It's more than that, but it's 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 the idea of artist identity. What's your identity? What's your distinctiveness as an artist? And that seems to have been almost corrupted by the idea of how are you going to sell? How are you going to get likes? How are you going to penetrate the market? Um, and it's completely understandable. But what gets left out a lot of the time is when when you, when they're talking about music in the, in that way is the function of music itself, the communication through music, what that is, um, why it's important, why it affects people, why people want music. Um, and sometimes, the, you know, it kind of gets it, it, that part of it, which you could call the, you know, the soft skill of music, the, the art, perhaps. Um, that gets eclipsed by everything else. Um, and I wonder with what was what has happened now in the situation now with this kind of enforced, changed landscape, whether that will alter any of that, whether you know the way that people have come to really, um, really treasure music over this time as a crutch or as a escape or as a, something to give meaning to what is a an austere and, and sometimes you know very bleak. Uh, world um i wonder if that will change that relationship that people have with music what do you think it keys into conversations we've had over the last seven years since we first met teaching this notion of brand and identity and story and narrative 
and the role that plays in music and communication and, and fandom. Yeah. Now, I maybe have a slightly different take on it. And my question to you and really the world is one of whether that notion of branding has ever changed and whether it's just become more revealed through the internet and through the practitioners that we have available to us to discuss it. If we rewind in time, you know, nearly 100 years ago, we have Lead Belly and, you know, the birth of popular music in, uh, you know, to put a kind of bracket on things. But uh, we could argue that Lead Belly was one of the first sort of rock stars. He was heavily branded against his wishes as a prisoner, um, according to the uh, the book Perfect Sound for- Forever. Um, I'm not a lead belly a researcher, but um, my understanding is that you know he was uh, he was authentic because he'd been in prison and he performed in his prison outfit, and um, he never wanted to be presented as a prisoner. And as soon as he could, um, he was successful enough to rebrand himself in the image that he wanted, which was in a suit. His audiences dropped. And this notion of branding goes, you know, there's a narrative through from Lead Belly to, you know, to Elvis. Um, and you've got the Sex Pistols. There are so many examples through history of constructed narratives. Bob Dylan. I know you're a huge Bob Dylan fan. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. And there is no more paradoxical figure than. Bob Dylan, the authentic, arguably greatest songwriter of the 20th 20th century. Yet we know his story to be absolutely one of total construction. So with the knowledge that you have in all of these narratives, how can therefore, how can there be uh, an issue with branding and, and musical identity? Or is it just more explicit? Everything you said is right. And, uh, uh, you know, there is... Uh, <laughs> everything, ever. <laughs> everything everything you've ever said is right. Um, <laughs> so thank you and good night. Um, I mean, I'm with you on this, but I'm arguing against the, the point my, because my we discuss it, it so my, much. No, my problem with it, and I do have, well, I have a problem, I don't have a problem with the, the idea of, uh, you know, as soon as music was sold and as soon as music became a commodity, sheet music, it was branded, so mm. there's a way. How can how can Company A sell more than Company B? As capitalism, right? So of course, that's always been the case. And you're right. And constructed identity and constructed authenticity and all these ideas that feed into fandom and why why we why we uh, buy into literally and and metaphorically into people's artistic identities and how they become part of our our narratives, our life narratives as well. The difference is that uh, a lot of for a lot of young people making music, they only see that side of it. They only see that side of it. And the, the, the stuff that drives that, which is the music, becomes secondary. Or it certainly becomes almost like an, uh, uh, an ancillary part of their work. And their work is to be a commodity. Well, I think previously what you had was you had uh, a, a music creativity that was then, to, to a greater or lesser degree, commodified. Uh, and now it's it's commodification first, and everything else follows it. So it's a bit. It's become the car is now before the horse for a lot of. Students. But would you not say that the commodification prior to the internet revolution? was predicated on album sales and the belief in the album as the most important musical artefact of the 20th century. So it was more invisible because we believed in it more, or maybe a certain generation believed in it more. And in what way has Instagram replaced the album for certain generations? My question was was my question was so potent it took you out. 
I think the CIA yeah. are monitoring this. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we've never had so many internet problems, actually, until we start discussing the system and then they're, they're, yeah. they're turning our internet pipe down. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, what I was saying really was how has, you know, that, that we know that, that that boom in what we would consider the art, the highest art form of, of musical creativity in the 20th century was based on radical increase in album sales as the century kind of accelerated in to its peak, probably at, at 2000 was with NSYNC and, and Britney, I think is the peak of the album sales. There but, you go. Um, when artists we witnessed... ruled the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when music was good. And then, you know, we saw a radical disruption in that system. And then a what we now consider to be a new economic model uh, to be a successful musician, and by successful, I suppose, could be defined as a person who who gets to practice music and gets the economic support to not have to do other things as well. <laughs> we could define See, that as success. I, yeah, that's one. That's one definition, but I don't think it's. Mm. I don't think it's the only one. I don't think it's necessarily the best one. Mm. Um, uh, it's. It's, it's, it's a wonderful outcome, you know, if you can live by creating work. But I don't think that should be, I don't think that should be held up as a kind of shibboleth, that that is the only, that is the, you know, that is the only goal. Mm. Um, you know, Philip Glass was still driving a taxi when he was 40, mm. and he had a, an opera on at the, at, at, at the Metropolitan Opera, you know, in New York. Um, Believe in what you do. Believe in mm. what you do so much that you'll do it anyway. Um, mm. it's, 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 to me, it's a purer message, and perhaps it's a bit more idealistic. But it's, that's, that seems to have been rinsed out of the system now. You know, the, the idea of um, almost a kind of curmudgeonly belief in your own in your own work because you you have an idea mm. and you want to. Do, that's what's important. Um, you know, I'm not saying I practiced this, by the way. I wish I wish I was more like that. You know, but I can see that I have a bit more of that than some of the younger people that I talk to about music. Mm. Um, who do seem to be driven. It's it's a very much a kind of you know it's uh, it's an analytics world. You know, it's about it's almost like graphs. You know, so uh, my thing, my likes have gone up. My things have gone up. Music's always had that you know chart thing and all the rest of it, but. Um, you know, I'm reading the, this. Uh, I'm reading Woody Allen's autobiography. This this contentious autobiography. <laughs> the, con- the controversial autobiography of Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I don't think it's controversial at all. That's a, again, that's another. Yeah, another very interesting topic. All that. Um, but uh, he talks in the book. Is I think it's a very good book. Actually, uh, he talks a lot about um, creativity, making his films, um, and how. He never looks at reviews, good or bad. Um, he never goes to award ceremonies. He doesn't do it. Um, and in fact, he's criticised. And one of the critics of the book somehow took took this to, to, as a kind of sign of his evil intent. Was that he he said on the day that John F. Kennedy was shot, um, he said he, he watched TV for, for for twenty minutes and then he went back to work. And this, the same thing happened when he won. Uh, four Oscars for Annie Hall. Uh, he didn't go to the ceremony. He was playing music in Michael's pub. Um, and then the next day he read the New York Times, oh, I've won four Oscars. And he put the paper down and, went, and I went back to work. Uh, and he was working on a script, you know. And I think that's, that is what I, to me, is what an artist is. Mm. Um what someone who is only interested in, you know, I had, a, I had a student recently who said to me, my plan is I'm going to go, I'm going to make tracks in five different genres. And the one I get the most likes for, that's the genre I'm going to do. Now that, to me, is not an artist. It may, maybe he, will, he or she, let's say, will become, use it, that's a methodology that they will then discover something about themselves um perhaps that's okay but it seems to me to be getting off on a very odd foot mm. you know it's almost like let's do a focus group decide whether or not i'm an artist 
And that again is the car is before the horse, as far as I maybe call me old fashioned. Um, yeah, I that's, think that's how I view it. This is what plays in really um, fascinatingly to the capitalist system and the responsibility of uh, practitioners to support, you know, young artists against the backdrop of student fees and zero hours contracts often working in places like Foot Locker to pay to be in university or to do music. The world is different to the world that we graduated into without that student debt. And a question I often ask myself when I'm, uh, you know, teaching is what is what is our ethical responsibility to facilitate a monetary income stream for the next generation? I have that thought too. And I, I, I don't think it's our responsibility to um, indoctrinate anyone in anything. All no. we do is is provide a, a, a toolkit. Mm. Uh, and the toolkit includes critical thinking, or, or at least to sort of look at the landscape and see how you might fit into it in a way which is not immediately prescribed. Um, so it's always about transferable skills and about how you can learn something, learn about... Uh, you know, maybe playing an instrument or interacting with other people, collaboration, and how you can use that in different different ways. Just to make people uh, not feel like they're on a conveyor belt into the music industry, you know. Yeah. And I have this big thing, I know we talked about this a lot, I always try to, at the, in the beginning of a, you know, I'm teaching one of these modules or whatever, I always say, we're not going to talk about the music industry music industry is is not the thing that should be at the center of your world the yeah. music community should be the thing that's at the center of your world the yeah. music community other people who do music facilitate music help music get out there help music be better help yeah. people hear music that's a community that's a network that's a community the music industry is something which makes a profit out of all that yeah. stop being a slave to that ultimately that can you will end up in it if you uh, if you amass a fertile music community mm. um, around, that could be a, in your band, but that could also be a wider network. Of, so that that's that's what I try to teach. Try to teach. Mm. Them. I think you do as well. But yeah, absolutely. It's you know, it's about belonging and contributing to something in a consistent and passionate way. And yeah, n- like it's the opposite, really, of of trying to fit in. It's just yes. we are all different we all have all different views and it's bringing that that independence to the forefront rather than um what happens seemingly in sort of human psychology when we want to fit in we sort of often carve away those bits that make us stick out and, yeah and actually um, there is a, there is an argument for you know if you talk about uh, which I seem to be all the time when I'm marking work I always seem to be talking about distinctiveness you know mm need to be thinking more about it and distinctiveness and you can see the overlap here as you know very well um with marketing and branding and and, and commodification and what and a, you know how do you stand out in the marketplace mm. well actually that's that's also quite a good quite a good engine for creativity mm. you know how do you do something that hasn't been done before um and that's n- doing something that hasn't been done before is not a motivation that young musicians seem to have very much mm. uh, it's much more where can i fit in where can i what what's the who can i you know impersonation is the first step to finding your voice we all know that but there seems to be a kind of almost a, a dictatorship of of the pre-existing you know it's a, the, the sense of like how can we leap over what exists in, into new territory mm. that doesn't i mean i was brought up in a period of music where that was the that was the defining characteristic of what good music was well i haven't heard anything like that before mm. uh, so i feel privileged in a sense i didn't realize at the time but looking back i feel privileged unless this was like you know, post-punk it mm. was like a lot of music was actually when you look back at it now wasn't wasn't very good um it hasn't lasted although some of it has you know uh, mm. uh, but what it did have and what what it was praised for what it was sort of predicated on was the idea that it didn't quite sound like anything else yeah um you know yeah, you could see antecedents, you could see some of the influences, but it, it was trying to be something new. I think that chimes in with uh, Mark Fisher's uh, 
role in cultural critique, doesn't it, with sort of the idea of hauntology and this notion that if you played a record from now, 20 years ago, in a dance floor, people would be largely carry on, feel pretty comfortable with that. If you played a record from 1991 to to an audience from 1971... They, they would think they, they were listening to the, the super futuristic music. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they might have a slightly different reaction. And I've thought a lot about this kind of idea of hauntology, and it really kind of struck a chord with me, as I think it struck a chord with a lot of people that have read Mark Fisher's work. Although I do wonder, you know, the role of musicians and thinkers like Holly Herndon in that. Yeah. Her music is bonkers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when you listen to it, it definitely brings up the great feeling that I have, um, which I genuinely love, is, is this music, do I like it? It, it, it exists to me right on the fringe sometimes of, of taste, of my taste metric. And her ideas of uh, voice synthesis and ownership of the sound of a voice and how that's all radically changing in the future. Yeah. How do you think musicians, you know, because there are loads of musicians out there like Holly Herndon who are doing, you know, brilliant and exciting things. I I was listening to a song by Yacht um, that was composed entirely on AI and they got the AI uh, machine learning algorithms to write the lyrics and the melodies. And again, the song exists on the edge of my taste metric. You know, it's neither good nor bad. It's kind of like the first time I heard Jungle or... First time I heard lots lots of, uh, you know, I mean, as a teenager, the first time I heard, you know, a heavy metal band and it was just this... And I was thinking, is this music? I was, uh, <laughs> couldn't make head or tail of it. So how do you think, you know, what do you think Mark Fisher would sort of say to that kind of, um, that kind of uh, style of music and musician? I think he would probably make a distinction between pop music and what Eno always calls, you know, laboratory music or whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, which is kind of what you're talking about. But I think what's really interesting is when the laboratory music meets pop music, that's, that's when good things usually happen. Another so, example of, of the Mark Fisher question is, uh, is the AI pop star Hitsune Mike. Yep. And I think that is where Holly Herndon and pop kind of collide. You know, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think that kind of says about the future of music and hauntology? I mean, is that that is the genuine future? Surely. Well, I think you. I think there's more than one future, and they're going to happen at the same time. <laughs> uh, it's like you know, we we still listen to Mozart. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, as you know, you can listen to Mozart and Holly Herndon on your playlist. You know, and that's going to continue uh there's going to be there are taste cultures there are there are maybe more blurred uh, taste cultures um yeah. uh, and that blurring may may become more 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 in evidence as time goes on and i think that's a great thing I and mean, that's that's a source of that's the positive of postmodernism, isn't it it's the mm. hybridization you know uh, i mean there's that book um, um that reynolds book at retromania um which I think misses a point, which is the idea of, of actually hybridizing, you know, disparate elements from the past can can throw up very exciting yeah. new recipes of music, you know, new new flavors, new new vistas. Um, I think that's something you and I are interested in mm. as, as musicians to some degree. But um, so yeah, I think you are going to have AI music. You're going to have generative music. You're going to have all these the, these things, and they will produce what they produce. But they're not going to annex everything. No. Same way that rock and roll didn't annex jazz. You know uh, mm. what? It, what? It, what? What? I think what you know in a sort of modernist idea, you get you get things supplanting other things. So you you, you have this evolution where in with the old order, out with the older, which is why when when we hear uh, you know. Dixieland jazz, as it's called, it sounds just totally conservative. But of course, when it was 120 years ago, it was radical, revolutionary. Mm. So that 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 that's what happens. Um, I think what's a good thing to me, a positive, is if you listen to some like early punk rock, it's not very good. It, it was a functional music. You know, it was exciting. It was a, it was a 
spasm. You know, it was a spasm and it, it function, had a function, which was to blow away the cobwebs. But as music, you know, I don't really go back and listen to that music, even though, you know, I, I enjoyed it when I was a kid, little kid. Mm. My, my elder brother was into it. And I, I, you know, I was kind of weaned on it a little bit. And that was the music, you know, and it kind of, everything before that was verboten. Um, but if you think about revolutions subsequent to that, revolutions, wrong word, but, um, you know, evolutions in musical style, genres that have happened probably in the last 40 years, a lot of that music, and you go back to the early Aphex Twin, and it's brilliant. Mm. It's great. Um, what's my point? Good question. Not sure. I think it's something about um, the idea of um, all these things existing at once. So you can have you, the, you know, AI music of music that, that, in a way, is almost that's almost immoral. You know, if you look at it from a kind of uh, 1960s, 70s singer songwriter across, you know, the idea that man, that's just that's not authentic. You know, that's not that's not allowed. Um, and I was I almost went into a Los Angeles accent there. Um, yeah, but it's uh, uh, that's. That's kind of now, you know, you can imagine a late night radio show is going to play that and it's going to play a, a Brian Eno track and it's going to play yeah. a, a modern composition track and it's going to play some electronic, different kinds of electronic music. And that's, that's great. You know, I, I love that. That's a, that's it reminds a, me of uh, Elizabeth Alka's great show Unclassified on uh, BBC Radio 3. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I think um, that's, that's more, the, the, you know, that, that's, that's a good possible future that that becomes much more of a widespread uh, thing you know, that you start going to an art show, you know, where you see sculpture and you also see painting and you see installations and you see, you know, so some of it's a very, a very old tradition, painting, mm. sculpture, and some of it's completely electronic, modern, futuristic, uh, and they're all art and they're all made by artists and they all went to the mm. same art schools and it's the same audience. Mm. So why not music too? I know um, Holly Herndon. Um, discusses a, and really incorporates ideas of surveillance and uh, and the idea of yeah surveillance capitalism in her work. What would you say you know the role in this post pandemic environmental age? What would you say the role of just you one I making their music is? Because that's something I often question. You know, this morning I was up at four o'clock in the morning, making, um, making granular, grand, grand, uh, so tired I can't speak, it's only 10 to 12, granular ambient music. Yeah. Now, that's not something you would consider, you know, protest music in the, you know, in the way that we kind of brand protest music. What, what do you think that, that kind of individual creativity says about us in this 21st century? And what role do you think it has in this, against this backdrop? Um, that's a very big question. I think I think artists are, in a way, they you know live by example, um, or, or or perhaps what I mean is they should. You know, they're they're they're, they're to some degree outside all the the, the the structures that we discussed at the beginning, um, and their their pursuit is to somehow make sense of the world, uh, or through existence, mm. through creativity. Any artist, you know, it's like. Um, you know, if you want if you want to see propaganda, read read a newspaper. If you want to know the truth, go to an art gallery. You know, or whatever. Mm. The truth, what it's what it is to be a human being. Yeah. So that you know, I think it's a really important work that artists mm. do because that's that's the stuff. You know, that's the that's the real stuff. All the rest mm. of it is kind of logistic, if, if you like. <clears throat> so I don't think that changes the way the the the, the current um, change landscape doesn't change that motivation yeah. behind that or the relevance or importance of that significance of that but um in terms of protest you know protest music you know you could say that schoenberg was protest music you know um lots of things are are available to us now that we can get behind whether it's in an environmental you know uh, environmental issues whether it's um, political issues we can lend our music to these things mm. you know we can get behind it we can we, we can become part of movements um, mm. we can you know we can name tracks you know whatever it is you know you can uh, 
I was listening to Julius Eastman this morning, and he named it because he he wanted it to be controversial. The fact that he was a mm. black guy making mm. classical music. Um, so the other one's called Gay Gorilla. He's also a gay. He was a gay black man. Um, <clears throat> mm. That's a kind of protest. That's a that's a politically engaged idea. There's all sorts of ways of doing it. I guess that's what I'm saying. I don't think we have to sort of say. Well, I'm going to do my granular ambient music for two hours, then I'm going to go and do it on a protest. You know, yeah, they're not necessarily that far apart, and it's 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 living by example to some degree. I think you know, it's um, yeah. It's I was really there. inspired by the Nan Shepherd book. Um, I always get the title wrong. The living, I think it's called the Living Mountain. I always call it the Lonely Mountain, the Living Mountain, and that is a is a kind of reflection on her sort of spiritual belief awakening in relation to her life in the Cairngorms and it's written against the backdrop of World War II and um, I love this idea of the war is ever present and the war shapes the book but it's not a book about war it's a book about being a person walking on the hills and yeah. uh, I think, you know, that, that really struck a chord with me. It was part of Robert McFarlane's coronavirus reading group. Right in the very early days of this, when we were looking for connection, I think we're all a little bit digitaled out now, aren't we? But yeah, um, in the very early days, when it was quite frightening, we were looking to belong and be part of things. And I, you know, I'm a big Robert McFarlane fan. Yeah. So I joined the uh, the book. I'd read the book before, but we read it chapter by chapter as a big kind of online community, which didn't really work that well, to be honest, because I couldn't kind of be part of it somehow. I couldn't figure it all out. Mm. Uh, but I read the book anyway, and, uh, yeah, it resonated with me in a very different way against the backdrop of, you know, climate change and uh, and um, and coronavirus. And, you know, this was the sort of early days of lockdown. So, you know, Black Lives Matter and that movement was, you know, ever-present, but it hadn't emerged again with the the force that it has recently. And, um, yeah, I think you're right. You know, this, you know, to me, making work, making ambient work, making minimalist work, it's, uh, I think this pandemic has really brought a connection to nature. The bird song, dawn chorus. Absolutely. You know, yeah. pe people have been talking about the skies feeling bluer as a result of less pollution, there's less traffic sound. And I think, um, you know, McFarlane will talk at length about this, but our human connection to nature has really changed as a result of this pandemic. And, yeah, I suppose, like you say, talking about a kind of form of protest, that making of that work is feels important to me to to reflect what it feels like to be a person alive right now. And the pandemic has accelerated my artistic drive into, into you know, into... To full force. I mean, I'm. I don't think I've ever felt such a drive to make as I am right now, and I feel like I'm, like I'm wading through a, a current pushing against me, you know, with the the kids at home and they're all involved in it, and we're home editing and we're doing all these things, and you know, economically we're in a different situation now because my wife doesn't have work, and yet the force of which I'm approaching this ambient music is quite puzzling in some respects, you know, but it just feels vital. It feels like it has to be but it's, it, it is, you know, art is how we make sense of the world, I think. Yeah. And I think as, as artists, but also as human consumers of art or, you know, uh, listeners or viewers or whatever, um, it's how you make sense of things. It's, it's uh, and when everything else is... I can hear you now. I lost you. For you a while. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You froze. You, you were, yeah. You, you froze. In a, you froze in a really interesting position. Actually, it's like you were about to <laughs> reveal the truth. You sounded like you were about to re reveal the truth. You were saying art is about. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you frozen again. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. You frozen in a in a in a brilliant. I oh, know you come back. You you were uh, you you like Groucho Marx. Um, uh, in a good in a good way. <laughs> yeah, art, yes, <laughs> art is important. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to say. Uh, I tell you, know, I think when when everything's uncertain, when you have this incredible uncertainty, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, your yeah, your face you. is is remaining unchanged. Yeah, yours is too. But, um, um, I can still hear you. 
I think when you know when everything is up in the air, I think that's when the thing you cling to the things which you trust and the things that you that are closest to you, things which define you the most. And that is when you're an artist, that is art. Isn't it? So mm. um, to me, that's why it's um, that explains your your you know your your energy to make and to create. Mm. And yours. <laughs> yes, and mine. And mine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. So I, th- I think, you know, in conclusion, you know, what, how can we conclude this? What, what role does creativity have to play in all this? Well, you know, it, it, we're, we're, we're not even halfway through this thing yet. That's the mm. thing. It's very uncertain what's going to happen. This, you know, at some point we're going to face up with a big economic collapse. Mm. And it's how big that is is going to have a big effect on what we do mm. um, and what we're able to do. Because we, it, you know, it might mean that we have to go and grow grow potatoes and to exist. Yeah. <laughs> Our creativity may be may be may be kind of squashed into something slightly more uh, uh, logistical. Um, mm. <clears throat> that's on one note. But it also it might be that we have to use our creativity to negotiate a very changed landscape economically Mm. um you know we have to we have to use that and that that might be to do with all sorts of things that could be to do with some kind of collectivization on one hand um you know whereby you're 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 living very much in your local community and um helping people who are really struggling and that could be one one aspect of life how life becomes for the next couple of years um Mm. Another thing is that you, you know, that you then have um, the need for music uh, and for, for this escape pod of music uh, becomes even more concentrated than it has over the last three months. Mm. Suddenly, the, this is the only escape from the shit. This is this, this, this music. This, suddenly, the music is the thing that makes the most sense. Mm. Uh, you know, we go back to Walter Pater's famous quote about you know. Music. All art, all art aspires to the condition of music. It's like all life aspires to the condition of music. You know, mm. you, you create. I always go, we've had this conversation many times, thinking of music as this, as this place you go to. You know, and when you're creating music, to, you're creating a kind of country in a way mm. uh, yeah. that people can inhabit, and, and that might become even more an important function of, of what creatives do. You know. Um, mm. In the, in the, so this all sounded quite bleak. Uh, you know, I think this is. I think these these are these are relatively temporary. I think in a couple of years' time, things. You know, we, we, it may not. It may prove that you know that the, the um, harbingers of doom were, were wrong. But I think we have to be prepared for something that we, we've never known in our lifetimes, which is, yeah. you know, a depression. You know, nineteen yeah. thirties style mass unemployment and civil unrest. You know, of some kind. Yeah. So. We have to be prepared for that, um, mm. and we have to find a, a way of fitting into that and and, mm. and helping, you know, <laughs> helping. So you know, maybe we need to do another of these podcasts in a couple of months' time, and we will yeah. we know a bit more about where we are down the line. See where we're at then. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed that we're still here. Yeah. Well, David, it's been great chatting to you and uh, doing it in a recorded form. These yeah. Are, you know typical uh, conversations that we'd normally have without recording which i suppose is what gave rise to thinking about making the podcast in the first place yeah because they're fun. always it's they're fun. always interesting and um and full of more questions than answers i think um, yes as usual as usual which but uh, it's nice it's, to kind of externalize some of these things and that, that's part yeah. of the process um, yeah yeah sorry yeah sorry i seem to have been banging on about dystopian politics more way more than i anticipated but there you go what can you do? It's definitely, uh, yeah, it's definitely kind of framed the uh, the discussion. But um, ultimately, you know, when when you've got a title, well, when you're when you're talking about creativity and against the backdrop of, you know, what the 21st century seems to be revealing itself to be, it's mm-hmm. inevitable that that capitalism is going to play a large role in that, and and also given rise to the title of the podcast, which is play in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Part of me wants it to be play the system. Part of me wants it to be play out the system. Mm. But um, 
ultimately it's you know it's about the way that the system that we are part of operates yeah and trying to reveal the way that operates so uh hopefully we can try and find that space within it for humanity for ourselves for each other yeah yeah so that absolutely so that was david shepherd in conversation on the new podcast play in the system i really hope you liked it it was an incredible challenging and interesting look um, into where we are as a species and where we're at as creatives at this pivotal moment in history so yeah i really hope you like that um david's music is well worth checking out as his his amazing book on brian eno next week we've got well i say next week probably isn't going to be next week next episode Next episode, we've got um, composer Nathan James coming to talk about his compositional process. So, yeah, if you're interested in that, um, Nathan James is a classical composer. And, uh, yeah, tune in for that. Really love to have you around. My name's Matt Goodison. Thank you for watching.